Good morning, y'all. This is part one of our video lecture on Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis. Let's jump right in and talk about what we know about this book. First things first, the title is actually an allusion. Allusion is a term I'm going to give you here in a little bit. It is a reference to the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. Iran now stands on the ruins of this empire. So as you're reading, I want you to think about why the author has made this particular illusion or reference. The book is a memoir, so it's nonfiction and tells the true story of Marjane Satrapi's life. It's split into 10 sections and covers four years from the end of the Islamic Revolution to the beginning of the Iran-Iraq War. This is actually a two-part uh, novel. I'm only having you guys read part one. The second half actually covers um, her late teens to her early 20s. It was originally published in French and won the New York Times Notable Book and Time Magazine's Best Comic of the Year. The book was, the, both of them together, the two-part book, was turned into a film, and it received an Oscar for Best Animated Film. So if you've started to read the book, you already know a little bit about Marjane Satrapi. She was born in 1969 and grew up in Tehran. Her family is a part of that sort of left-wing educated intelligentsia that we talked about in our last video lecture, meaning that they were highly educated, but also had sort of communist sympathies. And you can see that by some of the books that they give their daughter to read. She is sent to live in Vienna at the age of 14. And in part, that's because of her sort of political activism. And in part, it's because of her parents' concerns about um, her education. She will return to Iran as an adult where she'll get her master's degree. And then she'll move back to Paris where she sort of lives permanently um, and works as a cartoonist and an illustrator of children's books. So this book is a graphic novel, even though it's a memoir and not sort of fictional like a novel is, it's considered a graphic novel. So if you were to go into a bookstore and look for a copy of this, it would be in the graphic novel section. It's different from a comic and that's important to note. So comics are sort of usually cheaply printed and are um, in serial form, meaning that there are hundreds of them that have been written over decades. Whereas a graphic novel, you can read all as one text, all of the whole stories in one book. Here's that term illusion that I mentioned just a second ago. An illusion is a reference in one text to another um, text or um, important piece of information. So an illusion can be literary. So you see here in the second bullet point, the most commonly alluded to texts are the Bible and works of Shakespeare. So if Marjane Satrapi were to mention something from Shakespeare, she'd be making a literary allusion. An allusion can be historical. So simply by titling her book Persepolis, she's making this historical allusion to the ancient Persian Empire. It can be cultural, and you'll see a lot of cultural allusions in here, uh, especially as she grows up in the early 80s. Um, and um, it can be political. So I want to talk about some of the political allusions she makes in the text. Some important allusions in Persepolis. The first four people on this list are communists. So Karl Marx is the author of the Communist Manifesto. He basically comes up with the idea, the philosophical idea of communism, although he doesn't actually become a communist leader. The next three people on the list are all revolutionaries, both Fidel, Castro and Che Guevara were essential to the communist revolution in Cuba, and Fidel will become the communist leader of Cuba for decades until his death just a couple of years ago. Leon Trotsky was a Russian revolutionary, and he will become a member of the Communist Party once it takes over and becomes the USSR, and she'll actually reference the USSR in her text as well. Her uncle actually goes there. And then Rene Descartes. So if there was one that was not like all the others, it would be Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes is a French philosopher living a like a couple hundred years before all these other guys. Um, he was an Enlightenment author. So he's a part of that generation of individuals who starts to develop the scientific method, who, likes, who starts to look towards science and nature for answers to problems um, and confusing issues in society rather than to religion. It's interesting to consider our reactions and how we think and feel about Margie, the character, when we read the text. 
Um, and I think one of the things that can affect how we feel about the text is the art, um, we're going to talk about that in a second, and the author's use of point of view. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Marjane Satrapi chose, chooses to tell this story from the point of view of a child. So she's an adult, but she's writing from the point of view of a little kid between the years of 8 and 14. And I think in some ways this affects our reading of the story. So here's this person talking about um, communism, which as American readers we feel very suspicious of. And she's also sort of talking about wanting to take um, uh, a fistful of nails and go beat up um, a friend of hers because his father had committed crimes in the government. And these kinds of things, some of her thoughts, some of her feelings, we would find suspicious, I think, um, and unnerving from the point of view of an adult. But by telling the story from the point of view of a child, we're a little bit more trusting, a little bit more willing to go along with what she has to say. The art helps to establish that point of view. So while I think the art is very sophisticated in the sense that most of us would not be able to draw this well, it's also in some ways very kind of childish. Um, people have sort of rounded bodies and things aren't necessarily well defined. And so it helps to, um, the style of art helps us to see the story from the point of view of the child. I think also using this black and white in her text helps to set a sort of somber tone. There is actually a revolution and later a war going on, and she's living through that. And this is a serious topic, and she has serious and uh, conflicting feelings about that. And the use of black and white helps us to see that. So um, it's important to think about how the text and the art work hand in hand. And it says, see pages 3, 8, 13, and 17. We're actually going to look at those together. Okay, so let's take a look at this very first one. I think this is the um, one of the first pages of the section that you were asked to read. Again, notice the style of the art, right? Not very defined features, kind of rounded features. In some ways, even though it's a sophisticated um, skill, it's kind of a childish kind of representation. She talks about how this is the first year that all the girls were required to wear the veil. She doesn't really talk about how they feel a whole lot about that situation, but if you look at their faces, None of them are smiling, so that gives you a hint about how they feel of, about this prospect of being required to wear the veil. And then if you look at the second frame, it says, we didn't really like to wear the veil, especially since we didn't understand why we had to. And there, in a lot of these um, pictures, you see like two girls at the bottom corner here, they're playing horsey. One girl's got a couple of veils tied together and she's playing jump rope. So in many ways, this is an important religious artifact. So this would be like somebody taking, like if you wore um, a cross around a chain and somebody took your chain and was sort of like just twirling around on a finger or treating it like a, a toy, you might be offended by that. Um, but I think it shows here a complete lack of understanding. They're given the veil, being told to wear it, but not told why. And I think that's important to think about um, in terms of our discussion on uh, the discussion board for your last reading log in our discussion about religion. This is an excellent one as well. It says, I really didn't know what to think about the veil. Deep down, I was very religious, but as a family, we were very modern and avant-garde. And this shows her sort of mixed feelings, right? She's really struggling inside with both her um, sort of practical secular side and her religious side. And we know that she has very strong religious beliefs. She says at one point she wants to be a prophet when she grows up. And so she wants to respect this religious artifact, but she doesn't really understand why it's required. And I think this is causing conflict in her and in her soul, maybe. I love this one. So this one says, every night I had a big discussion with God. And then if you look at um, how big God is in the frame, that gives you an idea of how important God is to her and her life. And then if you look here in this one, God's holding her, cradling her the way, the way a parent might cradle a child. It's obvious from these two frames that God is incredibly important to her and that she feels a very close kinship or relationship with him. And I think that's going to be important as the story moves on. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, her parents are giving her all of these books written by and about um, important communist figures. And they're talking about communism in the house, but not really talking with her. We never really see her parents having um, deep heart-to-hearts um, about these philosophies, and I think that might be causing some confusion for her. And we can see that in this slide. So here you have God on the right, 
and Karl Marx on the left. And she said it was funny to see how much uh, Marx and God looked like each other. So they're starting to become one and the same or getting conflicted in her head. Right? She's having a hard time uh, separating her religious feelings from her political feelings. They're sort of getting all meshed together. And this is affecting her relationship with God. If you look at the later slide, she's talking to God and he says, so you don't want to be a prophet anymore? And she says, let's talk about something else. And he said, well, you think I look like Marx? I told you to talk about something else. And in this next slide, it says, tomorrow the weather is going to be nice. So these sort of um, deep emotional discussions that she used to have with God are no longer a part of her life. Her, um, all of her education and um, her uh, influences, especially because these influences and this education is happening without discussion, is causing a conflict in her faith. So she's having, in some ways, a crisis of faith, and she's only eight years old at the time. This slide shows us how far from God she's become. So here in this slide, she's begging her father to let her go on um, a march, on a political, to a political rally and march and protest. And she's in her bed and she's crying and she says, God, where are you? That night he didn't come. And we know from earlier slides that she had a conversation with God every single night. And so now all of a sudden her relationship with God has been um, in some ways destroyed because of all of this conflict going on in the world around her, not just with her parents and the books that they're giving her, but also what's going on in her school, being uh, forced to wear the veil. All of these things together are affecting um, her understanding of herself and who and what she wants to be in life. So the art and the text work hand in hand to create one sort of singular message. So we tend to sort of maybe just focus on the words, especially if you're in a hurry to get your reading done, but take the time to actually look at the art that she's created. There's some message, messages coming in with and through those pictures. The last thing I want to talk to, about, to you about today is um, buildings roman. This is a type of genre. It's one of my all-time favorite genres. A buildings roman is generally the story of an individual's emotional, spiritual, psychological and moral growth and development. And this is in fact a buildings roman. It's a very common, very popular genre, especially in children's literature. So I'm gonna give you some characteristics here in a second. You might even wanna pause on the next slide so that you can copy them down because there will be an exam question on the buildings roman. Okay, so the basic characteristics. You have a protagonist who is young and inexperienced and searching for meaning in his or her life. And the story focuses on that protagonist's maturation process. Maturation is about maturing, growing up. Okay. Something will spur the protagonist on his or her journey. Often that's some sort of, sort of form of loss or discontent. So, for instance, war and conflict might be some of that discontent for Marjane Satrapi. The journey consists of a lot of repeated clashes between the protagonist's needs and desires and the views of society. So the protagonist is often in conflict with larger social rules or cultural rules. And you'll see some of that coming to play here in the um, second section of the graphic novel. There's usually some uh, moment of epiphany or sudden realization where the protagonist realizes, ah, that's who I'm supposed to be and that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, and this realization allows the reader to sort of grow up and take his or her place in society. And so what I want you to do is be paying attention to Persepolis and these characteristics. You will have a final exam question and that final exam question goes something like um, identify a certain number of characteristics of the buildings Roman. How do these characteristics appear in Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis? Okay, so at this point, you're going to go ahead and read part two of Persepolis and complete the next reading log, and then you'll move ahead to part three and complete the next reading log, and then you'll see a second part of this lecture in which we talk about some of the important themes that appear in the text.